presence, fellows and guests. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come down and talk to you tonight. Um, so the lecture really is about showcasing some of the results of, of, of the two projects that we are involved in just now, the Northern Picks project uh, and also the Comparative Kingship project, um, which is our main focus at the University of Aberdeen. Um, the Comparative Kingship project was uh, a Lever Human funded project, began in 2016, a five year project, um, and is really looking at this formative period in European history in terms of the development of the early medieval kingdoms of um, Northern Europe. Um, the project has different case studies uh, in Ireland and Scotland um, and is a comparative project looking at um, notions of rulership uh, and archaeological and historical records of those um, uh, case studies. Uh, so there's different elements to the project. There's bringing together all the archaeological and historical evidence uh, and we have a historian on the project, um, uh, Dr. Nick Evans, who's a leading early medieval historian, um, and looking at rulership in the different case studies uh, and comparing that to broader European uh, traditions. Um, the elements of the project I'm going to focus on tonight is um, looking at uh, central places uh, of, of Northern Europe um, and particular case studies have been funded through the Leave Human Project, particularly our work uh, in, in Scotland. Um, but there's also other elements of the project that I won't really touch upon tonight. So there's um, an environmental element to that, looking at the environmental signatures of some of these central places uh, within uh, the landscape. Um, and also um, a big element of our project is really trying to provide a, a much firmer chronological basis for looking at particular areas of uh, medieval Europe, particularly uh, in Scotland, where there's been a very poor chronology um, over the years. So harnessing uh, the possibilities of Bayesian modelling um, and uh, the use of radiocarbon on a much larger scale than has been uh, possible in the past. Um, so as I say, the focus tonight is looking at um, central places. Um, and th through, through the project so far, we've realized, I guess, both the possibi possibilities and the challenges of a comparative context. So if we look at um, Ireland, we have this incredible wealth of settlement evidence. You know, 47,000 uh, ring forts uh, and hundreds of these uh, excavated. Uh, if we compare that to Scotland, <laughs> I realize uh, some of the challenges in that comparative context. So we have 1,694 hill forts in Scotland documented. Um, only 27 of these have early medieval dates um, post 400 AD. So if you compare that to um, 47,000 ring forts in Ireland, then you realise the difficulties. Um, but uh, one um, uh, obvious thing to say about this is that uh, um, that comparative conte context also leads us to, to, to believe that um, th uh, elements like enclosure is actually quite... Um, uh, specialised in the early medieval Scotland. It was something uh, uh, different to what was found uh, elsewhere. Um, so one element of our project um, in Scotland over the last uh, five, six years has been trying to increase the data set of early medieval enclosures um, across Scotland. Um, but that's not always been uh, successful. Um, you could call our project the 400 to 200 cal Cal BC project at times. Um, when we look at these uh, fortified settlements, that tends to be the dating for these uh, um, sites. Um, and it's only perhaps as, as few as one in ten that actually have early medieval uh, occupation. Um, so that really leads us to believe that what we're dealing with in Scotland is a different character of enclosure. Early medieval enclosed settlement was much rarer in Scotland uh, than it was in Ireland. Uh, and that really makes sense of some of the documentary evidence, the, the slim documentary evidence that we have for this period in Scotland, where fortifications, fortified settlement, actually appears a lot more commonly than in the Irish uh, sources. Um, and what we also get from the, the historical sources is that uh, kingship itself was also perhaps more restricted in early medieval Scotland uh, than it was, was in Ireland. 
So we can see uh, successful over, over kingships um, of the Picts uh, and, and of uh, Dalrida from the seventh century, uh, and we can compare that to the multitude of kings known in uh, early Irish sources uh, in the same period. So it looks like in, in Scotland, um, uh, the traditions were following more uh, continental and Anglo-Saxon patterns of having more limited um, uh, kingship. Um, and forts, I think, are really crucial to that in terms of being really key elements of early medieval uh, society. Um, so on that, on that basis, as I say, we've been trying to increase the data set in Scotland, trying to understand the broad patterns, how it develops um, through time. Um, but again, we're dealing with a very, very slim um, archaeological record. So this is a, a distribution map in, the, in our two case studies of Dalrida and, and Pickland of the elite fortified settlements based on historical sources, archaeology and place names, um, around about 30 sites uh, in each uh, case study or, or less than. Uh, and if you look at the historical sources uh, alone, this is the kind of patterns you get. Um, so uh, a multitude of sites um, in central Scotland where we tend to see as being the traditional cradle of the later medieval kingdom of Scotland, but you can see how late a lot of the sources are for these sites, whereas some of the earlier sites are actually on the uh, periphery of these uh, areas. Um, and it's also true that the archaeological investigation of these sites has been pretty slim in the past. Um, so I kid you not, this is, uh, I think, the, the only, or one of maybe uh, two or three um, structures known from uh, an early medieval um, fortified, uh, developed nuclear fort in Scotland. So really, um, a lot of our previous work has been keyhole in nature and very limited uh, in extent. <coughs> so for the rest of the lecture, I really want to focus on one particular element of the project, and that's been our work uh, in northeast Scotland, uh, in Pitland. So the Picts, one of uh, 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 a number of different kingdoms in early medieval, uh, in early medieval Scotland, uh, and perhaps the most extensive, extending from the Firth of the Forth um, up to the Northern Isles, probably to, to uh, Shetland as well, and across to uh, the Western Isles. So a very extensive uh, kingdom um, and an over kingship of the Picts known, known from the seventh century uh, onwards. Um, this is clearly a puzzle to, to uh, some scholars, some historians, um, a kingdom, as uh, Chris Wickham says, that uh, sometimes operated on a, on a larger scale um, and clearly puzzled by this. How the Picts managed this with no visible infrastructure in one of the most unpromising terrains in Europe remains a mystery, but they at least show it was, it was possible. Um, so this, this is a, a nice foil to, to, to our project, I guess. Uh, in terms of historical sources, it's certainly true that these are very limited. Um, we have uh, some notion of uh, the territories of the Picts uh, through things like um, the, the Pictish king list, which has an origin myth about Cruthny, uh, the father of the Picts, who has seven sons. And those sons are clearly a claim to territory with names like uh, uh, Kate for uh, Kate Ness and, and Fief for, for Fife. So we have a, a broad understanding of where the, where the Picts occupied, but in terms of you know, finer grained analysis of, of uh, uh, the political uh, and social makeup of the Picts, um, it's, it's very limited from historical sources, and that's obviously where archaeology comes in. Um, the Picts are first mentioned in late Roman sources uh, in 297 uh, AD um, as these troublesome tribal groups who live north of the frontier, um, and they go on to become these uh, uh, powerful kingdoms uh, in northeast Scotland. Um, so again, part of our project has really been trying to look at some of these elite centres uh, and trying to understand, A, what they contained, what, what their character was, and how they developed uh, through time. So we know that these are important sites. They are a reference in, in our sources for this time period, uh, and often in relation to important battles, uh, the place, place where kings are residing, um, and actually, in some cases, kings actually named after uh, these fortified sites in, in northern uh, Britain. Uh, the other iconic element of the archaeological record of the Picts are uh, the symbol stones, um, class one symbol stones, and then 
uh, also uh, cross slabs from, from a, a later period. Um, and these have always been uh, a fascination to scholars and Picts. Um, but again, very limited uh, 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 dating evidence for these uh, and very limited contextual evidence. So again, part of our project has been trying to put these two elements of the archaeological record uh, in, in a wider uh, context. Um, so I just want to highlight uh, four or five sites tonight, just really to um, take you through uh, the story, the, the big themes, the big um, developments that seem to characterize uh, the evolution of these fortified settlements through time, from, um, in this case, from the late Roman period through to about 1000 AD. So the first site uh, is this site of Dunnock uh, which is not this, it's here. Uh, this little promontory here. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground today. Why on earth were we interested in this site? Um, well, it was again uh, looking at the context of um, the fine spot of, of um, symbol stones. So there were five symbol stones known from the site. Uh, they include some uh, fairly standard uh, symbols uh, from the Pictish repertoire, these double discs, the fish uh, and the crescent. Uh, but you can see these are quite rough and ready examples, and they've often thought to be early examples uh, in, in the tradition. Uh, and these were found on the sea stack uh, in uh, the 19th century by a bunch of uh, youths from the nearby village, just in the next, next bay along here, um, who got talking to a local grave digger who says that they should go and look on the sea stack because there was gold buried, buried on top. Um, so they went for a frolic, uh, they walked along the coast, um, a great danger to themselves, uh, it says in the report, they got on top, started digging, and they didn't find any gold, but they found these stones, um, and they threw them into the sea. Um, and it was only in years later that people recognized what these were, went back and collected them. Once people began to understand what picture symbols were, they realized there was uh, a value to these monuments. Um, but really, um, very few people had actually been to visit the site since the 19th century, uh, and again, you can see why. <laughs> um, this is our access route onto the site. Um, we had a professional climber uh, get us up here. Um, what did we find? Well, basically, we found what the youth found in the 19th century. We found evidence for a low stone wall around the uh, edge of the stack, which is uh, the context um, that the youth record uh, of finding the stones. Um, and basically what we've got here is the remains of a, a timber-framed rampart uh, of a promontory fort, an uh, incredibly eroded promontory fort um, due to the geology of the site, which is veined with sandstone, which has uh, led to its kind of catastrophic uh, destruction. Um, elements of a uh, facing wall, very little stone left, because believe it or not, the site was actually robbed for stone uh, in the 19th century and, and before. Um, and inside the, uh, the uh, rampart, evidence for uh, buildings, structures, um, hearths, um, from uh, some very rare uh, architectural remains from this time period. So there's almost, um, you know, in terms of the Pictish settlements from this time period, um, we have you know, a handful, literally a handful of, of sites known. So there's very rare architectural traces from this time period, and hearths, floor layers uh, of the buildings. Uh, and then evidence for um, uh, people living uh, on the site. Uh, we have uh, grinding stones uh, um, from rotary querns, uh, spindle whirls, uh, and also very unusual um, Roman imports for this uh, time period. They have a, a Hoffenheim um, glass cup uh, with bits of Samian. Um, and th uh, this far north, this is incredibly unusual. Um, there's maybe about 10 shards of Samian known from Aberdeenshire. Um, also evidence for, for metalworking, there's burnishing stones, um, and this is what we think the site would look like on that kind of blue peter revealment uh, here. So again, it, it's basically, it's a promontory fort, uh, highly eroded, um, and this is what remains of the site. Perhaps the most surprising element of our work we've done here has been the, the dating of the site. Um, there's very few um, fortified settlements known in Scotland uh, after the, the last century uh, BC. There's very few sites uh, during the Roman Iron Age. Uh, but this site occupies the third and fourth centuries AD. 
um, exactly the time period in which the Picts are first mentioned in a late Roman sources. Um, and so this has put the, uh, the site uh, in a firm chronology and also suggests that these Pictish stones from the site are indeed early examples uh, of that tradition. And in a recent antiquity paper, we've argued that the origins of that symbolic system is through contact with the, with the Roman world. Um, and again, this is uh, an important site for, um, for that argument. <coughs> um, so moving on, um, we're gonna, now going to move slightly inland uh, to Rhiney, which is west of uh, uh, Aberdeen. Um, and this is a site uh, long known for its uh, uh, amazing group of uh, Pictish stones uh, located here. Uh, it's also got a very interesting place name. Um, so it comes from the early Celtic word uh, re for, for king, uh, but it's not a documented um, place um, like many places in, in northern, <coughs> northern Pictland. Um, so it's got this uh, group of stones, eight um, Pictish stones, and it's the biggest concentration of these class one stones known. Uh, and it includes uh, the cross stain, uh, which has got salmon and a Pictish piece carved on it. Um, uh, a warrior figure carrying a, a doorknob butted spear here uh, and a shield quite eroded. Um, and then the most uh, famous monument from Rhiney is, is, is this character here, the Rhiney man, with his big pointy teeth and carrying his axe uh, over his shoulder. Um, so again, we wanted to understand more about the context of the stone. So the Rhiney man was ploughed up right next to the cross stain here, which is very unusual because it still stands in its original position. Uh, just to the south of the village of Rhiney. Um, and so the year after uh, the Rhiney man was found, uh, a photograph was taken showing uh, this complex series of enclosures uh, around, around the stone. Uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, we managed to get some funding together to actually investigate these enclosures. Um, and so this is what we found. This is the, the standing stone, the cross stain here, uh, standing next to a building uh, here, uh, more buildings next to it, uh, and then ditched enclosures, and also, hard to see this one, but a, a, a large wooden wall or palisaded uh, enclosure around the site um, on a little knoll just to the south of the modern village. Um, and again, quite an unusual landscape location compared to the, the kind of classic sites we think of uh, from Pickland. So over uh, five seasons of excavation, this is the ground plan we produced. Um, showing the cross stain, uh, and we also found a, a socket, which we think is probably for the Rhiney Man or for another one of the stones that uh, came from the site, actually stand at the entranceway into these enclosures uh, with a building standing next to the cross stain, other buildings um, inside. <coughs> so, again, here, Preston, this is what we think it would look like uh, with um, uh, the, last, uh, the, the latter phase of the site, uh, this very complex. Um, oak plank um, uh, palisade or, or, or box rampart here with buildings inside and sitting in the shadow of um, Tapa North which is an Iron Age um, uh, hill fort, um, one of the most impressive known in Scotland. Um, and not only do we have uh, a, a, a fortified settlement here at Rhiney, we also have a, a contemporary uh, cemetery so down by the modern village uh, a few hundred metres away uh, there's another group of stones, including the warrior figure that was uh, found within uh, a cairn, uh, and big square enclosures and uh, a very characteristic square barrows, which is um, the, the kind of stereotypical Pictish burial type of, the, of this period. Um, and we have dates from the barrows showing that these were contemporary with the uh, um, settlement uh, um, nearby. Uh, in terms of finds, we've got evidence for um, high status uh, elite activity. We've got uh, um, late Roman amphora um, turning up at Rhiney uh, in, in the 6th century. Uh, this is the only find spot really uh, so far in, in eastern Britain and by far the furthest north uh, identified so far. Um, some uh, evidence for uh, 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 nice metalwork. Uh, uh, toilet accessories, brooch pins, uh, glass coming from western uh, France, uh, and also some more unusual metalwork as well. Um, and the beauty of the site of Rhiney is that we're beginning to find objects that you can see represented on Pictish stones, again beginning to link the chronology 
of the stones and their iconography much clear and more clearly to what we're actually finding at the settlements. Uh, so this is a little iron pin here um, with a, a serpent, you can see the eye here, and the tail biting onto the end of the axe. So very similar to the, the axe that the rhino man carries here. Um, and we think this is a, a form of sacrificial axe, uh, like the, uh, the one uh, axe hammer found in the Sutton uh, ship for you. Um, clear evidence for, for production, I think it's probably one of the largest uh, early medieval metalworking assemblages uh, now known, um, uh, including evidence for production of penannular brooches, axe-shaped objects, um, hand pins, um, and a whole range of different uh, uh, metalwork finds. Uh, we have ingot moulds from the site, um, and also, I think perhaps most excitingly, um, a range, we've got about 12 or 13 of these moulds for making little animal figurines. Uh, so this is a, is a hound or a wolf. You can maybe just make out its head here, its tail, uh, and the legs of the animal. And we have different animals represented within the moulds. So it's incredibly exciting. And again, they look very similar to the types of, of animal carvings you see represented on picture stones. So this is a picture stone. Uh, found about um, 10 or 15 miles um, from the site. <coughs> we also have uh, bits of weaponry, um, and this is all from midden uh, deposits um, thrown into to the ditch. Uh, it's a plow truncated site, um, so we've only got a very partial picture of what was here, but even so, it's still an incredibly rich assemblage. Uh, and in terms of radiocarbon dates, we now have something like uh, 60 uh, radiocarbon dates. Um, and it's an incredibly boring um, ox cart plot. Um, basically, it looks like the site emerges in, in the late Roman period and the 4th century, uh, and it's out of use by the mid 6th century. So it's quite a restricted uh, chronology uh, for the site. So going out of use about 5, 550, 560 AD. Uh, <coughs> right, so that's um, some work that we've largely uh, completed. Um, we've uh, we've uh, published a few. Uh, interim reports on, on both of those sites now, uh, working on the full publications. Um, the rest of the lecture is going to be uh, work that we've done more recently, um, and some hot off the press information as well. Um, so this, this summer's uh, uh, adventures um, to really cold, wet, high places uh, was this site, uh, which is called Benahi uh, in Aberdeenshire. It's a really iconic hill. It's one of the most notable landmarks in, in Aberdeenshire uh, and North East Scotland. Um, <clears throat> again, it's uh, got a really interesting place name. Uh, it seems to mean the mountain of the people of Kay, and Kay being one of the seven sons uh, of, of Cruthney. Uh, and it's got a spectacular fort, one of the highest forts uh, in Scotland um, known, um, which has long been, again, a, a chronic element of Northeast archaeology, but very poorly understood. Um, there are two lost uh, Gallic sagas um, uh, of 10th century date or earlier, um, which seem to refer to Benahi or the area around about. Uh, one is called the Ravaging of Benahi, which suggests the site was, was destroyed or the area was destroyed, um, and the Ravaging of the Plain of Kay, um, again suggesting um, major um, social and political upheaval and events in, in this region uh, in the early medieval uh, period. Um, it's uh, more um, akin to some of the classic sites of early medieval Scotland, very similar ground plan to places like uh, Dunad and, and Dundurn, with a summit um, a granite tower, um, an upper uh, rampart and a lower rampart uh, here, um, quite small. Um, it has been investigated in the past, um, by uh, Christian Hagen, uh, who was an early um, uh, associate of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, uh, who investigated the site uh, in the 18, 1880s. <coughs> uh, and this is the plan that Christ, uh, Christian uh, produced, uh, which shows the, the lower rampart here, one of the ancient sways, uh, the upper rampart, and also a rampart up by the granite tor. Uh, and then that combined with the way that the stonework is spilled down from uh, what appears to be from the tor suggests that the tor itself was actually enclosed and had structures or buildings on top of that as well. So it would have been a, a three-tiered um, uh, enclosure 
really very impressive. Uh, Christian McLagan also recorded a well in the site which did not appear on any of the recent plans, including uh, the Royal Commission as, um, for Scotland's plan as well, which would be a great pleasure to tell you when, when we find it. <laughs> uh, so this is the site here. Uh, this is the Royal Commission plan. And uh, in, in, in uh, uh, July this year, we investigated with a, a series of trenches here. Um, this is the, the lower Citadel uh, rampart here, uh, actually built on huge granite blocks. Each of these probably about a ton, ton in weight. Uh, so, so it's quite incredible. They've actually landscaped this hill in order to actually create the rampart here. They've, they've created a more level platform inside. So huge investment and labor in order to build the ramparts in the fort. Um, and we, uh, surprisingly, um, Christian McLagan had reported very extensive excavations of the fort in the 19th century. We actually found a very good preservation, uh, including deep midden deposits full of animal bone, uh, fish bone, uh, and also some small finds as well. Uh, and we also rediscovered the well that Christian uh, had recorded uh, in the 19th century uh, with very elaborate steps down to the well uh, and a small um, uh, uh, well, well cavity here, which is soon to be empty, the kind of 19th century backfill uh, began to began to function again. Um, so it's a, a little um, well that holds about 60 litres of water. It's really quite a remarkable construction. Um, and basically, wherever we excavated on the site, we found evidence for uh, settlement. So this is up by the Grand Tor. Um, uh, this is a small test bit here showing occupation uh, deposit extending. Um, downslope from there, including some quite unusual finds, pottery, almost uh, unknown in mainland Pictish sites, uh, gaming pieces, um, crucibles, crucible shards, um, and re really exciting evidence for actual buildings and structures uh, inside uh, the fort. <coughs> uh, and hot off the press, we've just got these dates um, this week. Uh, these are the dates for the fort um, so far all um, centering on the 8th century AED. So it gives you an example of the kind of forts that are being um, developed by the 7th and 8th century. Larger sites, more complex, um, and uh, 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 these um, higher hilltop uh, settlements. <coughs> um, as I said in the introduction, another part of our project is not just doing excavations, but also trying to uh, um, date archive material. Uh, so this uh, was a, a, a foray south for us into southern Picklands, uh, and this was one of the better investigated sites uh, dug in the 1950s in advance of complete destruction by, by quarry of this patch of Craig uh, in Fife. Um, and this is uh, the site that I showed in the beginning with one of the few actual uh, previously documented buildings with, within one of these forts. Uh, an important metalworking assemblage from Clatcher Craig as well, which the uh, chronology for has been uh, debated. Um, so we've, we've redated archive material from the site. And what's really fascinating about the site is that the radiocarbon mates from the, the three inner ramparts, uh, the settlement features and what looks like an abandonment phase um, are very, very close. Um, if you look at the span of the site, it's um, at the most 90 years, and it could be as short as 40 years. So it looks like some of these sites, rather than being long-term central places, are actually you know, boom and bust um, sites that um, emerge very rapidly and then go out of use uh, very rapidly. And there's clear evidence for the destruction of the sites uh, with all the um, inner ramparts destroyed by fire. Um, and this uh, dating of the site is uh, around about 600 to 670 AD, so 7th century uh, AD indeed. <coughs> right, so just, just one last site to, um, to introduce you to, um, and this is probably our, our, our largest project uh, at the moment, and one we're hoping to do more work uh, with in the coming years. Uh, basically, um, because of this very um, troublesome uh, coastal erosion happening at this uh, at this site, um, undermining uh, the seaward rampart, which is just just here. Um, and it's a site that's been long in uh, the uh, popular imagination about uh, the Picts 
um, but very little, um, again, modern archaeological work on the site. So it's a promontory fort like Dunacair, but on a whole, di uh, a whole different scale. So this is the upper citadel of the fort. You can just see the ramparts uh, here. The ramparts on this side are entirely removed in the 19th century to build the harbour here. Uh, and this is the lower citadel of the fort and extended into the town before the town was built in the uh, 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 early 1800s. <coughs> um, in terms of scale, it's by far the largest early medieval site known in northern Britain. Uh, so this is Dinad, um, which uh, is a you know, very famous uh, site um, from uh, uh, the Scots uh, in, in the Dalriada kingdom uh, in the west. Um, this is Dundurn, uh, and you can see the scale of Burrick Head, about five, five hectares, including the defences, uh, which doesn't sound huge, but for an early medieval site uh, in the north, it's, it's very extensive uh, indeed. Um, it also uh, has a really interesting um, sculptural uh, component. Uh, it's got a number of bull car carvings, uh, six survive, but there's many as 30 of these. Uh, recorded uh, in the 19th century, and again they were found during the development of the modern town uh, when they basically um, destroyed uh, the, the landward defences and part of the uh, 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 inner defences as well. Uh, and these seem to have came from right about the entrance into the upper fort, so marking that transition into uh, the upper citadel. Um, these might date to the 6th, 7th century. Um, based on uh, our historical parallels. But we also have an assemblage of, of later sculpture, early Christian sculpture, uh, from the site, including fragments of uh, a, a box shrine and uh, cross slabs as well, including um, uh, depictions of warriors, uh, mounted warriors, uh, on the stones. So clearly, uh, there was um, uh, an important early Christian site within uh, the fort, uh, and these uh, came from the modern graveyard, which is dedicated to uh, St. Aidan, uh, abbot of, of Linda's Farm. So a really interesting Anglo-Saxon connection there. Uh, in terms of wells, um, it's got the most elaborate example known. Um, so this was discovered in 1809 when they were trying to find a, a water source for the modern village. And they found a, a green patch in the upper, upper uh, uh, fort. And they dug down and discovered uh, barrel vaulted um, uh, uh, enclosure with a rock cut um, well here, the little walkway around the bed. Um, and they uh, blasted the bottom of it with dynamite to try and increase the water flow <laughs> uh, into the cistern. So it's not been well treated like many of these uh, monuments. But again, a really elaborate feature of this form. Uh, so this is uh, how it survives today. Uh, most of the land, land were defences destroyed, um, this side also destroyed, uh, and then all that's remaining is the uh, ramparts of the upper citadel here, and part of the ramparts of the lower citadel, um, and the interior <coughs> areas as well. Um, there have been previous investigations, some really important uh, antiquary uh, investigations, for example James MacDonald uh, in the 1860s, uh, who actually um, excavated through the lower rampart, which I don't think would be allowed in a modern health and safety context today. Um, they're about eight meters wide and more than six meters high, these ramparts, so incredible constructions. Um, but this is the section that he produced, showing that there was timber framing or timber lacing uh, within uh, and midden layers surviving. This is uh, in, in the lower citadel um, uh, here. And the beautiful water watercolors by James MacDonald. Uh, and then Hugh Young in the 1890s, uh, it was uh, his grandfather who uh, led the development of the modern town, who destroyed the site. Uh, and Hugh Young excavated the site, uh, and then a, 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 an ancestor of, of, of the Youngs in the uh, 1990s gave, gave a site to the Burkhead Heritage Trust. The Youngs have been involved in the site for a long time. Um, he uh, also showed the complexity of the ramparts, the huge pieces of uh, sandstone that have been used to create the, 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 the facing of the rampart. Uh, again, recorded really complex uh, timber elements to this wall. Uh, and this is his work. I mean, you maybe just see these shadowy figures in the background um, showing their ex excavations, looking at the wall face here. 
Uh, and uh, Hugh Young discovers some interesting uh, artifacts from the site, um, evidence for the pole axing of cattle, ingot molds, um, a rhiny man style axe, and the spearhead here. Um, and also uh, retain some uh, an animal bone collection which we've been looking at, which is uh, stored in the National Museum of Scotland, uh, which also included um, a, a human skull and a human leg bone, which we've dated very recently to the early medieval period. Uh, the only modern work um, really was Alan Small's excavations in the 1960s, um, who showed again uh, complex uh, timber lacing or timber framing within the rampart. Uh, but unfortunately never published his excavations and suggested that um, the whole of the interior of the fort was very badly disturbed and there wasn't really anything remaining to investigate. And that's really the, 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 when we came in in 2015 was the picture that we had uh, was that you know, um, you know, we might find some evidence of the ramparts but the interior of the fort uh, was going to be heavily disturbed and indeed various archaeologists told us not to bother working at Burkhead because we wouldn't find any. Um, so we initially worked in the gardens of the Coast Guard Station, um, mainly because it's an unscheduled part of the monuments, it gives a bit more freedom to uh, do test bits and the like. And very quickly we actually found very well preserved archaeology. So under about a metre of disturbance, 19th century, um, you come down straight down onto floor layers, um, postals of buildings. Uh, so this is within the, the gardens here, um, showing floor layers, a hearth here, and the outer wall of a, a 8th to 10th century building. Uh, so towards the end of the first millennium AD. Uh, and the floor of this building looks like it's been destroyed by fire. Uh, we had some really unusual finds, fittings from a chest or, or a shield, um, bits of weaponry again, the sword hilt here, and also uh, two coins of uh, King Alfred, um, which have been uh, pierced um, for, for wearing here. Uh, and this is just one building, there's another building here, and also uh, walls going across the structure here as well. Uh, and from that initial test painting, we got a, a basic chronology of the site suggested that it was in use from the 6th century AD through to the, to the 10th century. Um, and that formed the foundation for our recent work um, which is our Leverhulme Fund work, um, trying to build on that initial test pitting at Borough Head. Uh, so in 2018, uh, we opened test pits down in the lower citadel and also looked at the seaward um, rampart. <coughs> um, and very quickly, we found um, more uh, building plans. Uh, this is going under uh, uh, someone's house again. This is a, a sunken floor building about five, six metres across, um, and uh, got a, a plank uh, construction uh, to it. Um, and this is the lower citadel uh, rampart, uh, which was more like a civil engineering project than an um, excavation project. It was very challenging in terms of uh, the uh, overburden <coughs> here. So about two metres of rampart collapse uh, over the top of uh, midden layers. Um, and these are the same middle layers that uh, MacDonald and Young record in the 1800s. Uh, um, and again, really good preservation, including little um, uh, bone pins here, uh, and dates from the 7th and 8th century through to uh, we've got one 10th century date from the top of the middle layer, um, underneath all the collapse. Uh, so a very secure chronology uh, for that. Uh, but more excitingly is, is the seaward uh, rampart. And this, unfortunately, is one right on the edge of the uh, erosion. It's about half a metre away from an active erosion edge at the moment. Uh, but it survives about two and a half, three metres high. Um, originally six metres high, uh, we uh, reckon, based on the antiquarian excavations, uh, and showing exceptional preservation of uh, the timber framing here. So you can maybe just make out these, these burnt layers here, which are actually the horizontal beams and the transverse beams of uh, the timber lacing. It must be some of the best preserved um, of this uh, period in, in, in general. Uh, and then this year we went back. Um, again, there's real logistical challenges in excavating uh, sections of the wall because of the overburden. Um, but this is the kind of evidence we're getting. Uh, oak beams um, preserved through charring. 
um, for the upper couple of meters of the wall, and the lower uh, part of the wall seems to be buried in the aluminium period uh, with uncharred beams here, uh, and sitting directly on top of occupation surfaces. Uh, and up against the ramparts, we have buildings uh, preserved um, with burn stones and other uh, everyday um, evidence within these buildings, although we've really only scratched the surface uh, here. Uh, and essentially, wherever we've dug in the last two years, within the fort, um, underneath the modern overburden, we come down to very well-preserved early medieval structures, which, as I say, is incredibly unusual uh, for this part of the world. Uh, so this is another building. Uh, this is the two walls here, with floor layers here. Um, and again, really well preserved by uh, you know, the 19th century overburn, but also because essentially this is a big sand dune promontory sticking out into the Murray Firth, and there's been lots of sand deposition through the centuries, covering over uh, and preserving very, very fragile floor layers, you know, a couple of inches thick in, in some cases. Uh, and then down in the lower citadel um, this year, uh, evidence for even larger structures. This is, is uh, a, a, a a huge wall extending here, we think it curves around, uh, and we think this is part of a, a, a massive building within uh, the lower citadel, uh, with the floor layers preserved inside. And we have at least half a metre of stratigraphy within this structure, uh, which is absolutely jam-packed full of animal and bone, environmental evidence, uh, small finds and the like. So this is the kind of archaeology that we're really hoping to get our teeth into over the next few years. Uh, particularly in the upper citadel where the coastal erosion at the site uh, is worst. Um, and in terms of chronology, um, going from one of the most poorly understood sites, um, already we, we now have, um, I think, 50 rated carbon dates from the site, which allows us to, to model on a really detailed level. So we have a start date at the moment for the site in the 6th century, 540 to 595. Uh, AD and it ends in 910 to 965 AD, so in the, in the 10th century. And that's a really, really interesting time period for, for the Picts. It's the time when uh, references to the Picts actually disappear from the historical sources uh, and we get an emerging or a takeover um, by Gales uh, of uh, the kingdoms of the Picts uh, and the creation of a new kingdom called the Kingdom of Malba, which is essentially the forerunner of the medieval state of, of Scotland. Uh, and this happens in the late 9th century into the early 10th century. Um, and one strong factor may well be uh, the, the presence of, of, of Vikings in the north uh, taking over big areas of northern Pickland. Uh, and there's a strong suspicion they may well be involved in the destruction of this site uh, in, in the 10th century, with clear evidence for the ramparts being destroyed by fire uh, and the building's sequence ending quite abruptly in that 10th century uh, period. So, just to, to, uh, to sum up, um, we can see, I think, you know, from our early uh, comparative approaches to looking at fortified settlement in Scotland and Ireland, that this is something that is quite distinctive in Scotland in terms of uh, the rarity of sites um, and how often these are referenced uh, in sources. And so clearly fortified centres were a major element of kingship in, in Scotland uh, in, this, in this time period. Uh, we can now see that some of these are emerging as early as the late Roman period, exactly the time period in which the Picts are, are first mentioned uh, in, in uh, Roman sources. Uh, and they go through certainly to the 10th century, and in some cases there's probably continuity with uh, later medieval castles and and uh, defended sites in, in some cases. Um, but we can also see at some sites like Fletcher Craig that some of these actually had very short chronologies um, and were boom and bust sites. They, they were perhaps created by powerful leaders um, and uh, these were um, overthrown uh, or the lineage um, uh, was overthrown uh, and some of these sites go out for use quite, quite rapidly. Um, from the 6th century, 7th century onwards, uh, we get more uh, complex sites, the, the so-called nuclear force develop, developing, and that maps on quite well to the first reference uh, to an over-kingship uh, of, of Picklands from uh, the 7th century uh, onwards. 
um, and we can embrace the, the Wickham uh, critique of, of the fix. Um, but I think we can also see that one of the reasons that the fix perhaps had this very extensive um, uh, kingdom or series of kingdoms uh, was that um, uh, things like uh, uh, forts were clearly one way in which rulership was um, extended over an extensive uh, territory. And what we also see at the picture site, I think, are unlike uh, 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 some sites, is a very clear investment in the kind of sacral elements of power with an iconography of power very, very obvious through things like the picture stones, depictions of individuals like the Rhine Man clearly uh, underpinning uh, uh, notions of power and government, governance uh, at these sites. Um, and finally, you know, these forts remained important until the late first millennium AD, unlike previous research that suggested they might have gone out of use. Um, and it's the destruction of sites like Forakhead in the 10th century that may well have led to fundamental shifts that ultimately led to uh, the demise of the Picts. Um, as, as, as a, a social, political, and, and, and language group in this, in this part of the world. So I'll end there, other than to say we have a book out, so please buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. tribal identities um, referred to. Um, and as you go through uh, the Roman occupation, uh, those identities north of the frontier become fewer and fewer, um, resulting in, in uh, the, the Picts being really the only major identity referred to uh, in, in the fourth century. So it looks very much like you've got some sort of um, social and political amal amalgamation of groups north of the frontier in face of, of the empire uh, on, on the doorstep. Um, and you can see that you know, they're involved in things like the barbarian conspiracy in, in the fourth century, um, and communicating with other barbarian groups across um, uh, uh, Northern Europe in, in this time period. So you certainly seem to have some sort of amalgamation of different groups. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's simply a nickname, a Roman nickname, uh, uh, the text, but it's clearly an identity that sticks, and it's perhaps that kind of anti-Roman identity that's very key to, to their uh, identity going, going forward. Um, so it seems to be the presence of the empire on, the, on your doorstep is creating this um, social political cohesion of groups um, um, further north. inscriptions on, on picture stones, um, so they're writing uh, in, in Gaelic. Um, also, uh, the, the best interpretation of picture uh, symbols are that they are some sort of naming tradition. Oh. So it is, it is a form of writing with a very limited uh, syntax. Um, so that's another form of writing. We also get Latin inscriptions on picture monuments as well. And then another major discovery of recent years has been Mark Tarver's work at Fort Mohammed, a major 
Peter's Monastery in the north, where he has clear evidence for the production of vellum. So they were clearly making books and illuminated manuscripts. Um, but for whatever reason, we just don't have any of those uh, surviving. Wow. So I think it's very, very likely that there was a much more extensive um, uh, written uh, tradition in Pickland. Um, but for whatever reason, we haven't had the survival of this document through time. Perhaps because the Pictish identity, the Pictish elite culture was ultimately surpassed. So you know, we haven't had these objects and uh, books um, retained uh, into the next generation. Thanks. I So what are they trading uh, for these Mediterranean imports at places like Rhine? Um, well, in some ways, your guess is good as mine. Uh, metalwork might be one obvious uh, element in terms of you know, huge amounts of production at the site, um, including Inca folds. Um, but other possibilities are things like uh, leather. Um, and if you listen to people like Gildas, you know, slaves, <laughs> um, which is another obvious um, thing that would be trading. Uh, with um, these uh, Mediterranean traders. Um, so we don't really know what's going in another direction, um, but those are some best guess, guesses we have. Uh, mining, not that we know of. All, all the silver um, it seems to be late Roman silver um, right throughout the Pictish period. It's only in the banking age when you begin to get new sources coming in. So as far as we know, they're not, they're not mining probably the local resources. Again, this was something that has been quite slow emerging. So, in Wainwright's famous book, uh, The Problem of the Picts in 1955, there were no Pictish burial, burials known whatsoever. Um, but in the last uh, 20, 30 years, particularly through the aerial evidence, um, we can see that uh, um, the classic Pictish cemetery is a, a square barrel cemetery, but much later in date than the ones from Yorkshire and the um, and these seem to date from the 4th, uh, certainly the 5th centuries, through to the 7th centuries. Um, and they enclose longest burials, but they also get longest cemeteries by themselves, or so accompany um, the square barrel uh, cemeteries uh, as well. Um, so there's um, probably about 60 of these cemeteries known um, across Pickland uh, today. Um, my PhD student, Julian Mitchell, has just finished up. Uh, a thesis on, on this uh, question, and she has basically reviewed all the aerial evidence uh, there is. Uh, there are also a, a very few, um, uh, four or five examples that are still standing of these viral cemeteries, so you can still visit them on the ground today. Um, but there are quite few in number. Generally, there's less than 10 virus um, per cemetery, as many as 30 would probably be the biggest. So, so they seem to be quite again, restricted in numbers, um, but they are quite monumental, some of them, so some of the barrels reach up to 25 metres across. Um, there's no grave boots, uh, so they're not investing in terms of uh, grave boots, but they are investing in these quite elaborate um, barrel mines. Uh, and you also, really interestingly, you get some of them conjoining, so it looks like they're almost creating lineages of the death to architecture uh, of, of these monuments. So they're fascinating. Um, but again, you know, we've had very few large-scale investigations of these cemeteries, but it is beginning to emerge. Can you just follow up to the extent, how much they are to the extent outside Longest Borough? Longest Borough, yes, yes, if you find them across Elementary and Scotland, but the square barrows themselves, apart from some possible examples in Manfusing Gallery, are largely, as far as we know, in Pickland. 
So they do seem to be largely a fictitious position. Um, just showing that some pretty wonderful sites. Is it, is it slightly surprising that there's, that there's no evidence of heat use of them um, um, at all? And sort of following up from that, once you get past the year 1000, what, what is the archaeological evidence for the distribution of a, 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 of a new society with new power? Is it totally uh, a, 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 a separate from that distribution of the um, No, there are, there are sites that are reused. Really Sites like the Emmett Castle, uh, on the south end of a dark age site underneath, Arthur Castle, uh, up near Loch Ness, um, and there are many uh, sites underneath. So you do get continuity, at least in terms of location of some of these sites. Um, but those are not the sites we tend to investigate because <laughs> you know, the, the presence of a castle on top of these sites really severely restricts what we can do. So we have generally been targeting sites that don't have that same level of reuse in, in, in the high medieval uh, period. Um, so there is some continuity of, of you know, fortified settlements <coughs> into the high medieval period. Um, but generally things like modern baileys um, and, and the like are quite different landscape locations to, to some of these, some of these pictures plots. So the likes of, of Benny is it, it's really interesting because it's so so marginal today. It's one of the first places to get snow. It must be the highest there in the port part site in Britain, I think. Um, so there is some unusual landscape choices about some of these sites. And it seems to be a kind of mix between um, you know, being a defensive location and also a very a highly visible location in the landscape um, as, 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 I guess, a symbol of a quite extensive ownership of the people living, or at least uh, uh, occupying these, these sites at several times a year. Yes, could I just ask about the paintings? Um, I suppose they were language or, or place names. So we know it's a uh, Britonic language, um, so very different to most of the place names in Scotland today in the East or, or Gallic. Um, you do have seven place name elements that are thought to be, thought to be Pictish, things like uh, pet names, pit, pit names, um, but they're almost always um, coined with uh, a Gallic element to it. So it seems to be again Gallic becomes the, the major language in Scotland, including in the East, and even in the, 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 the quite important and you know, wealthy farm names, pet names, I mean, it's a parcel of land, uh, ultimately become Gallic in, in, in form. So there's very little survival of uh, Pictish names, but where they do survive, they are generally, you can generally map them onto where we go to pits or what find. So pet names, for example, extend from Fife, uh, up towards Caithness and a few Western Arts, so generally map on to where we think the British Kingdoms uh, extended to. I don't know what it means, I'm not a place name expert. Um, it could be English. English. It could be, yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Um, I would have to ask Simon Taylor, who's a British place name expert, or probably. Um, generally, yeah, the names don't really map on that, that well to picture stone locations in any specific form. Um, but they are, are a clue, but a limited clue, so Ryan is a fantastic clue to the importance of that site in terms of the place name. Uh, done it here, um, the place name elements that are, are done for fort, and care for fort. So it's the fort of the fort. <laughs> so it's, it's helpful, but not, not massively. One final one for me. Um, Monasteries in Pictish territories. Any sign of Christian paraphernalia or uh, these elite sites? 
that's um, yeah, I mean, the only real site so far is the evidence for um, the early Christian sculpture from, from Burghead, um, where you have you know, fragments of shrines, fragments of, of cross slabs. Um, that's really unusual uh, in these, these port plant sites. Generally, they have um, a very little in the way of sculpture, uh, or where they do doesn't tend to be early Christian character. Uh, so that's a really interesting find. Some of the other forts, places like Dundurn, they have um, early, what look like early churches nearby, within a couple of kilometres of the site, but not actually within um, enclosures um, themselves. Um, but from the 9th century, century certainly, probably earlier, 8th century perhaps, you do get some of the lowland complexes, places like Cortiviant um, and uh, Schoon, and places like Meagle and St. Legions, which uh, appear to be um, parts of royal estates that clearly have important churches there as well. So we have fragments of, from Fortini, for example, a fantastic arch um, from, from, from a church, and then Christian handbell, and again, freestanding crosses. So there are sites like that, um, but they don't tend to have those fortified elements. So Burkhead is quite unusual in that respect, in terms of combining those things. Thank you very much. Thank you.